now I get to do the, a little bit more of the fun part. I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker. And our first keynote, or the keynote speaker, is Dr. Bruce Gabrielson. For you, those of you who don't know, Bruce was the lead author of the 2007 State of the Art Report. And he's been working at least 10 years in the IA side of the insider threat arena and two years for intelligence community support for the insider threat arena. In addition to being the lead author for the previous SOAR, he was the DOD Technology Advisory Group Chairman for Insider Threats for five years and a member of the National Insider Threat Working Group in the intelligence community for two years. His most recent related scientific contributions include the invention, design, and transition of two leading edge computer network defense tools, Trickler, a passive network mapping data tool, and the audit data extraction utility, which is an advanced audit data extraction agent and analysis capability for near real time insider threat attack identification using audit and audit like data. He's, uh, he's up to 128 technical papers and counting and three books relevant to various aspects of information security. Plus, he's listed as the inventor of three patents in the telecommunications industry. His doctorate's in electrical engineering, as well as master's in computer science, engineering, and business. He's, he's also a member, if you look a little bit online, you find out he's a member of two different sports halls of fame. And ladies and gentlemen, my pleasure, our keynote speaker, Dr. Bruce Gabrielson. Okay, all thanks, right. Thank, thank you, Mike, and uh, thanks to Griffiths Institute for hosting this event. Um, it's nice to see a few of the people out in the audience that I've worked with for a number of years, going back, uh, as Mike said, to the my work at Naval Research Labs back in the 1980s and 90s, where we were developing tools to uh, hack into networks, all the way up to uh, supporting NSA uh, through insider threat uh, detection and countermeasures and then the most recently in the intel community. It's also nice to know that every time I come to Rome my allergies are important and they still work so you may see that as well. Um, so what I wanted to do and what I thought I would do this time uh, is give you my personal views on what I think about insider threats and also uh, maybe some parting remarks on where I think uh, we might want to go in the future with insiders. And now I got to see here, and I want to start moving this to see. Okay. So a little background on the SOAR. Uh, it's kind of interesting. The, when I put this conference on, when we were starting to pull in data for the first SOAR, I think, I, if I remember right, I had Dr. King do my, uh, inst uh, my keynote. And the reason is, as a longtime researcher, it's always nice to say, you know what, you get the guy with the funding to come in and do the uh, keynote. That way he's part of the solution and uh, as a buy-in. And I don't have a dime to give you guys, so I guess it's a little different from my perspective. Uh, but let's talk about that SOAR. Um, you know, it's been almost seven years since that data was current. Five years ago we released it, but it took almost two years to get through all the reviews and security reviews and things to say that, yeah, we can release a document. The document was released FOUO still, but it took a long time. And that's because there are different organizations in the uh, government sector that consider insider threats um, very uh, sensitive data, okay? And if you want to get solutions, and you want to get solutions out there in the commercial world, you've got to tell people about some of the things so they can develop solutions for them, or the academic community as well. So there was a lot of interaction going on to, hey, should we release this, should we not talk about this, and so forth. Okay, so the data is, is outdated because there's a lot of new technologies that have evolved. You saw a couple of things on the uh, uh, announcement about the bring your own device and cloud computing. Another one I've been working on for the last couple of years relates to virtual machines and that's a, that's a headache as well. But you know, we've, insider threat didn't go away. It's, it's still there uh, and, and I'll just mention Manning and Snowden, but the idea is insider threats are still there. We still have a problem with them 
and some you know, are very visible, but there's a lot of others that you haven't heard about that are less visible that prove insider threat is really a problem. I know when you hear announcements for, for conferences and they say, oh yeah, we want to talk about insider threats because uh, it's not a well understood uh, field. Well, you know what, it's pretty well understood. The solutions might not be understood too well, but the, the issue is there. And if you look at the last uh, state of the art report, a large section of it dealt with proving insider threats a real issue and it's a, it's a growing issue. So it, it, there's, there's newer tools that have been developed, there's technologies that have come along, and you know, now we're gonna have to start looking at, hey, let's come up with some ideas or solutions to move ahead and address some of these new technologies. Um, you know, and this, another thing, by the way, deep packet inspection has gone beyond deep packet inspection. It's gone to, how about deep diving into databases of personal information? That's another issue which I want to talk about in a bit. So I, I break down, uh, and, and remember, my background is primarily the IA side, but not completely the IA side. So I'm going to talk about profiling to start with, and I'll get into each one of these in a little more detail, but here's Bruce's view, not necessarily how everybody else looks at insider threats. And, and I see personal profiling, and that's just uh, indicators or precursors that maybe somebody's doing something. You take a look at uh, somebody's personal information, lifestyle, and so forth, and you say, you know, here's what somebody did in the past with this kind of a profile. Maybe we can analyze that or use that same kind of a profile. Uh, to predict what might happen with somebody else who's in the same situation. There's something I call activity profiling, and that's related to what somebody does on their job. And like I said, I'm gonna get into these in a little more detail in a minute. And it, it, you can profile and, and look at, maybe this person isn't the same as, as uh, or isn't the same person that started out in a position. Then there's behavior profiling. I kind of call this also bad behavior profiling. These are the things that you can detect or maybe detect, you can't always detect them, but you know what happens afterwards. And they're sus very suspicious in nature. So I'll, I'll get into personal profiling a little bit more first. It, it's usually developed from actual use cases. And uh, what you have to do, unfortunately, is collect a lot of data. And that's private data about a person. So these repositories that have a lot of data yeah, you can go in and see if anybody matches a profile of one of these things that somebody's developed. And there has been a lot of uh, research in that, by the way. Uh, you know, Carnegie Mellon. Who's the Carnegie Mellon people in here, by the way? Oh, there they are over there. Yeah, really good. I, w I read all your research reports on your, your uh, personnel profiling work you're doing. Those are, those are good. Uh, and then uh, Pacific Northwest Labs. Anybody from Pacific Northwest Labs in here by any chance? Okay, they've done some pretty good work on... on uh, personal profiling as well. And, and like I say, this is, this is a sensitive area, which maybe there's a way around the current laws, and I won't say a way around the current laws, a way of complying with current laws and still being able to do the job. Then there's activity profiling, and this is one I was very interested in. I almost had some uh, funding myself for research into this area. But, you know, people seem to perform work in a certain way. So there's a lot of artificial intelligence tools out there that'll take a look at your emails, take a look at your browsing habits, take a look at documents and give you a sense of what that's all about. So I haven't seen it, too many people try and apply that artificial intelligence to your work activities. I, I won't say I haven't seen any, but I haven't seen too many. But you know, a normal person in a normal job with normal background has something maybe like this normal down here, okay? That if you graph what they're doing and using artificial intelligence to talk about the kinds of things they do, that's kind of what it looks like. Their main, the, the main lobe would be the, the main area they work in and then a couple other areas. Then you have abnormal, and this, is, this becomes interesting because you might have had this with somebody like Walker. You know, you've got somebody who's constantly going out to other technology areas, which now we can analyze those kinds of things and saying, you know, why is this guy looking at that? Why is he looking at this? Why is he looking at this? And these things start to stand out like a sore thumb. 
Now you say, huh, oh, there's an indicator. And understand, all I'm talking about is a threat indicator to start with. I'm not talking about what you would do once you've got that indicator and want to look at somebody in detail. Then there's behavior profiling, which I've done a lot of work in this area as well. They're primarily IA detectable things. Um, hacking, masquerading, you, you know, you, you're, you've stolen somebody's credentials or you're trying to exfiltrate data. Uh, one of the things that, I don't know if any of you have seen the, uh, the um, report that I wrote a couple years back, trying to compile all the different use cases of how people would exfiltrate data, how they would break, it, break in, hack into a system, um, and all the, uh, the and that, it, that report was uh, distributed uh, through the National uh, uh, Insider Threat uh, Working Group. And uh, the idea would be that, yeah, we do know a lot about insider threats. We know what they do. We might not be able to detect it until too late, but we know what they do because there's not too many new ones that come along. So, you know, not too many new approaches that come along. So we know these are the kinds of things we need to look at. In fact, one of the tools that I worked on to detect these kind of things was developed about two buildings down down here at ITT. Um, so not only did that talk about uh, use cases, but it also talked about activities that somebody could do at a command prompt that would be very suspicious. Normal, normal person would never do those things. And, and, or if they did them, it'd be highly unusual. And those are things that are detectable either through an audit detection or other activities on, a, say, a workstation that you could detect and you could know in near real time what's going on. Another one I really like is behavior profiling. You know, here at uh, Rome, they developed a very good keyboard analysis um, capability that would detect who a person was fairly quickly based on their keyboard activity. Okay, another one that I really like is mouse activation because now if somebody logs in remotely, even with latency, you can still determine within fairly accurate uh, and very short time if that person is the person you think he's supposed to be. So now you've got some tools out there. They aren't deployed, and I'll get into that in a little bit as well, but the idea is that there's some things from the behavior perspective that, uh, yeah, you know what? We could find out if it was, or more importantly, we could say with some percent of accuracy that it's not who it's supposed to be. Then there's this, this multiple logins from a remote site. You know, you go, you go out to, on a trip, you log in with your cat card or your soft cert on your computer, you log in and, and do some work on your system. Now, within a very short time, all of a sudden, there's five logins exactly from you from different parts of the world. By the way, those are detectable too. There's something that'll detect that. Not deployed, but it's detectable. So the idea is, you know what? It's probably somebody who stole somebody's credentials because of one way or another they got a hold of uh, the, uh, the login information and the, uh, the token that was used. So those things are out there and be interesting to see why some of those things aren't deployed. Okay. Now, before the IA world, we were just concerned with losing data but it's not always the data dummy. Sometimes it's the capability. One of the issues that I've had to deal with fairly recently is what happens if you have a trusted insider, a user out there doing his job, and suddenly that user's gone and there's a malicious user who's already logged in with that person's credentials. So it's, they, you aren't trying to protect your data at that point, you're trying to protect the capability. What's going on, uh, you know? If you were a malicious insider at that point, you wanna see, well, what are they really detecting? How are they processing it? What can they determine? So there's another issue that's an insider issue, but it's not necessarily protecting the data. So I put this up, but I'm really gonna talk about some, throw you some ideas and stuff. And by the way, I have no clue why you told me I was going to have a half hour here. That's not what I asked for. But let me, let me just talk about some of these things now. Um, first thing I mentioned, and, and it'll be some concluding remarks as well. First thing I mentioned was don't say we don't know about insiders. Don't say we have limited 
information. Now, we have a lot of information. In fact, when I see announcements for conferences that say, oh, we don't know much about insiders, all I'm thinking is the guy who wrote that doesn't know much about insiders. You're right. But there's a lot of stuff we do know. We don't know it all. But if you looked at the entire boundary of insider problems, I think we know a lot. And it's in different enclaves. But still, we know a lot about insiders. We know what they do. Okay. Another one is, uh, let's see, that I've seen. We need uh, massive amounts of information. Nobody wants to give it to us. Well, okay, I've seen that quite a few times. We have a lot of information, okay? Why do you want more information on what somebody did this last go around when it, unless it's different than what you've already detected? Uh, is there something different out there that you need to know? Yes, okay, it's nice to add deltas to what you already have, but there are a lot of repositories of insider threat information out there. Now, maybe not accessible to everybody, but there's a lot of stuff already out there. So you don't need to go and say, well, commercial industry never gives me any information. Of course they don't. Uh, a company doesn't want to say, hey, we just lost all of our proprietary data to an insider, because then the stockholders say, well, well what's wrong with you guys? How come you didn't protect it? So you aren't going to get that kind of information, but there are plenty of reports out there that are in, of a general nature that say, you know what, this was the percentage of things, the estimated loss of dollars this year from insiders. So we have that data, and we have, if you're looking for techniques, remember I said there's a report out there that tells you about uh, uh, the majority of techniques that insiders use. It's not always something new. It's usually the same thing they've done before that you just don't have a way to protect against it, or you haven't installed something that would detect it. Okay. Another thing, why haven't we deployed all of those tools and capabilities that are out there? Well, I'm going to throw out an idea, probably because they aren't COTS tools. Yeah, I found out a few years ago when I developed something that, you know what, it would detect a lot of stuff, but it wasn't a COTS tool. So until somebody turned it into a COTS tool, the potential customers weren't going to look at it. Oh, I see somebody laughing back there because he knows the whole issue. <laughs> okay, here's the thing. If you're a company and you develop a solution, you want to sell that solution, you want to make some money on it, well, you got to have a buyer for it, and you aren't going to get a buyer unless you got a tool. Now, what happens if you're a researcher at an academic institution? You develop something that works, but you know what? You go and present it to somebody. Maybe there's somebody out there who likes it, and they're going to say, well, go find somebody to transition it to. So maybe what we need to do is look at this whole issue a little differently. Why don't we go the approach that, how many of you are familiar with the host base uh, security system? Okay. Well, I don't know if you know that I'm the one who presented that approach to the Enterprise-Wide Solutions Steering Group several years ago because I had to start looking at the issue from a different perspective. Why don't we start thinking about normalizing a... Uh, a framework that we can just take plug and play. No matter who develops it, if it's COTS or GOTS, we just plug it into something, and if it works fine, and when it doesn't work, you pull it out and you put something new in or something better. So that's one approach. Now, how does that impact uh, the customers? Well, it would be nice if I only had to train one user to look at a, a browser interface and if that user could just say, okay, here's one that pops out to the top that I really have to look at, wouldn't that be easier than training 10 users on 10 different tools? Now, there might be one organization out there that is trying to look at that approach, but what they've done is take tools and folded them into a uh, centralized framework. But, you know, maybe look at a normalized approach where it's the same kind of a thing if it's a network-based uh, tool, then it'll just plug in and look at network-based does, host-based tool, same kind of thing, a behavior profile, a, um, an activity profile, and so forth. Just go with a, a centralized approach that makes it much easier and also makes the transition path easier because you don't necessarily have to come up with all the background stuff to support it. If it works, you can use it until something better comes along. And all the IA uh, aspects are and, and I am an ISSO right now, by the way, on a, on a sensitive system. But all the IA aspects then would be taken care of in the back end by this framework. So that's something I think uh, would be very useful to look at. Now, 
Last one I want to talk about is um, privacy. As you know, within the last couple of weeks, the PRIVAC access requirements or PRIVAC uh, privilege has changed. Uh, a lot of that has to do with who has access to that private information and what can they look at. Okay, I see the government person back there going like this. Yeah, because I got hit right here with that one. Okay, um, so only some people should have access to that private information. And one of the things that was looked at recently that hasn't really been considered too much in the past is age and family structure, family value. You know, older people have a different perspective on what they, because they've been socialized to think that, yeah, we got to protect certain kinds of things, we shouldn't do other things. And then family structure is also important because, uh, you know, a older person doesn't want to destroy his family necessarily, so they're going to be very careful about doing some things they shouldn't be doing. Younger people, a little different story. But, you know, is, is that age discrimination now if you're going to hire somebody to do certain kinds of work? Don't know. Okay. But it is an issue that's being looked at. But let's say we have these big repositories out there with a lot of sensitive information. Wouldn't it be nice if we had this framework that popped out something that this is a real one we got to look at, and then the person who is going to go investigate only has access to the data related to that person? In other words, maybe a little bit more background processing takes place instead of that person has access to the sensitive data and they can go look at anybody's information. So now the metadata gives you something or this intelligence gives you something, uh, this um, uh, uh, intelligence uh, information that you're pulling out, artificial intelligence that mines and says that's a, a particular thing. Maybe all that goes on in the background. So the only thing that pops out is this uh, um, alert. And now you go and only are able to look at that information. And after you've gone through the, uh, the court process to make sure you have access to it. So that's just one idea. I'm sure there's probably other ideas as well, but that's one I've I've, I've tried to think how could we uh, comply with the laws and also go out and be able to do the job that needs to be done. So what that is, is that saying, yeah, this guy who has access doesn't have access to everything, only things that are really related to the issue at hand. Okay, so I hope I gave you some other ideas. And by the way, during the I have some really good questions. So the people on the panel, unless I'm stuck on the panel, are going to get hit with some hard things to answer unless I hear some of the things I'm hoping to hear back here. With that, I'm taking questions. Yes? I want to discuss your concept of health, safety, security systems in light of the fact that, uh, let's go back to that 1989 when we did the NETSAC contract with all of these teams. We were seeking funds to provide real-time network analysis and network analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I'm not sure if that's applicable in this context, but you know we do have requirements to protect that cabling, and we've gone to fiber optics and stuff. Um, okay, I can talk to you about that because you're thinking IPv6 is now a big issue. Okay, yes, we don't know what's on those cables necessarily. Okay, uh, yeah, but maybe I'll, I'll talk to you about that one offline. All right, do we have uh, another questions out there? Yes. Okay. Okay. So let me run back. Oop, I don't want to give you those yet. Okay. So here's activity profiling. And here is, okay, hold on just a minute. Let's see, I want to go up. Here's activity profiling, and that's you perform work in a certain way, okay? And here is behavior profiling where you're looking for bad activities. Okay, 
did a study, did a research study um, at an organization I was working at, large government organization, and I said, what are your normal things that you do when you come in to go to work? You log on, you look at your email, you uh, do a time card if you have to, and then you go out there and you might look at a news feed or something like that, and then you go and you pull up a document, maybe to, if somebody's emailed you a document, you pull it up, you read it, Otherwise, you go back and start working on a particular document for some period of time, or maybe a couple. What happens if you log on? The first thing you do is you go search your files, and then you download three or four documents all at the, within a very short period of time. That is not normal activity. Or you've used some artificial intelligence that says, yeah, my work is really related to agriculture in China. I'll just throw something out. And every time you log on, besides looking at agriculture in China and what's going on in agriculture around the world, you're looking at weapon systems in Cuba. A little different than what you should be doing for your, your job activity. So that's, that's what I'm getting at. Those kinds of things are detectable and predictable. But if somebody isn't doing those kinds of things, then that should be a trigger that maybe we ought to deploy something else and look at what this person does over some period of time. Uh, now, uh, the um, behavior profiling is a little different because those, those show up in audit logs. But what happens if audit logs aren't looked at in real time, by the way? The person's got the data and they're gone if they're impersonating someone else. And then you've got to go through the whole uh, uh, investigative process to see really who did it and where they came from. Now you have these other issues with uh, uh, in the say the SIGINT world that that system's compromised and it may never come back. You may never see that log data. You don't know what happened out there. Okay, so wouldn't it be nice if we had something that would detect in near real time, which which I was, I was working on something like that uh, just a couple of years ago. The detect in real time, so it basically had some countermeasures associated with it. And it would detect and respond rather than just detect after the fact. You can, some things you can detect very quickly that this is going on, and you can apply other uh, techniques then to go and look at what is happening in real time. Does that, does that give you a, the differences? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Would you characterize it in terms of what IA tools you would bring to bear that activity profiling would make more use of semantic analysis tools? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, uh, activity profiling isn't bad. All you're trying to do is it's the same kind of thing as uh, the biometrics. You're trying to come up with a normal profile for somebody. And somebody who doesn't fit that profile, but, and, and you know, there's research that's gone on now um, related to what somebody's doing out there and collecting the kind of uh, metrics that would say, yeah, this is the normal user. I, I think MITRE was uh, the organization, the last time I checked, was doing that kind of research. But the idea is, hey, there's normal activities. Everybody does the same thing. How many, well, let me ask, how many in here, when you log on, do you, do you look at your email? Nobody? Oh, come on. I had 100% in a major organization when I asked them that. So how many of you did time card when, when you first log on? Yeah, well, some of you guys do it the night after, so that's okay. So how many of you look at the current news feed from the company or whatever before you start working on whatever it is you've got to work on? Nobody in here does. Almost everybody does that. And then the last thing is, how many of you download, other than what's emailed to you, four or five different documents at the same time or within a near proximity of each other? One, huh? Okay. I, I don't know. My, my system don't even handle that many of the documents I have. But all I'm saying is, people do things normally. If it's abnormal, then something's wrong, and that's an indicator. And I get very worried when I see abnormal behavior, especially in the world of artificial intelligence, where you can find out, you know, what somebody likes, what somebody's doing. And, you know, those those things are deployed on the internet, so they can target market you. So, okay. Any other questions at this point? Yes. So, uh, one question related to the uh, real-time use of audit data. Mm -hmm.
we also audit quite a lot of behavior. Mm -hmm. But the problem is we don't make use of that in real time. Right? So wh where, why is that? Where's the main gap there? Is it a technical issue? Is it more of a governance issue? Um, <laughs> okay, I can't. I'm not answering for the government. Right. Okay. Um, personally, and I'll give you my personal opinion, um, there hasn't been 100% solutions out there. Nobody wants to deploy a partial solution. And there, and there aren't necessarily uh, COTS tools that'll do that. But if you can detect, in near, and to me, in near real time is while it's happening, you can actually watch the progress of somebody on your system. That's pretty good if you don't pull out all the audit log data. You only pull out parts of it that are useful. And go online, you can find lots of reports on that. Most of them I wrote, but there's a few out there. What's interesting to me is that the credit card industry, for instance, does a really good job of doing this online monitoring of activity. Sure. Trying to lock you out going making a transaction. I like that approach, right. and that's a very good approach, and that's the commercial industry, okay? All right, any uh, other questions? All right, thank you. Okay, Bruce, thank you very much.